Almut is uh, here as an independent activist, and I'm going to start this as a kind of conversation where I ask Almut some questions about herself. So um, she's had many years working with people in Russia and Ukraine. So I'm going to just begin by asking you, Alma, to just please tell us a little bit by way of your background about how your work has connected you with people in Ukraine in particular, but also in Russia. Uh, so thank you for inviting me and thank you everybody for coming here. And since we just heard this fascinating presentation by Ian, I do want to just reach back a little further to when I was 10 years old and I was living in Vienna, Austria, and you've just heard about Austria. And I remember very well when the accident in Chernobyl happened. I remember it was a very unusually warm spring and I remember how the, the adults around us, they were trying to make sense of it, but they really couldn't. It was a danger that you couldn't see or feel. And they couldn't tell us what to do about it, except come right back home after school. Don't dilly dally. Um, it, it was also that it happened and how it happened, it aligned very well with the Cold War thinking of the sort of late Cold War period that was all around us. Vienna is just an hour from the what the old Iron Curtain used to be. But my grandmother's house was actually right at the Iron Curtain. It was so close that I wasn't allowed to ride my bike in that direction because there were border guards and they were armed and it was scary. Um, so there was this sense of tension and fear. And then it, there was also the sense of like, everything over there on the other side is worse than here. Everything is in worse shape. The environment, living standards, industry, fashion, lifestyles, and also people there are just sloppy and careless. And Chernobyl, in a way, um, satisfied all of these stereotypes that people had about what's on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And then, of course, it very much changed our lives. You've seen the fallout maps, and what it meant is like there was no more mushroom hunting for my family, for nobody. There was no more hiking for many years. Um, and interestingly, uh, Austria does not have any nuclear plants now. It didn't have any nuclear plants then, and it had just years before that, in 1978, it had rejected nuclear power. Uh, a referendum defeated the first ever nuclear power plant that was already built and then put on the, to a referendum. And the population said, no, we, we're not gonna have it. So it was never even fueled up and never started working. Um, and I think for a long time, people in Austria felt very glib about that. Like, oh, look at us, you know, we're so much smarter about this than everybody else. But as a small country that is surrounded by countries that have nuclear power plants, of course, that doesn't protect you at all, right? Because it doesn't protect you from the weather patterns and the rain. So later when I, and this is just to say, this is an event like many, like the wars in the former Yugoslavia, you know, at, at, soon after the end of the Cold War, they, they reverberate to this day. They keep coming back to us. A few years after Chernobyl, when I decided, I decided I would go in to be a diplomat or work in international relations and I would work on conflict and peace in Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet Union. And so I studied international relations theory. And, and as part of that, I studied international security policy, because if you want to understand conflict, you have to stand. So the thinking goes security policy, right? Uh, and I studied that actually in the US. And inevitably, um, a lot of the body of this theory comes to us from the Cold War. So it's a lot of it is about nuclear history. And all the theories that have been developed by some very eminent thinkers about when and whether and in which circumstances nuclear powers would actually resort to using nuclear weapons. And that is a big, when you're in this field, you read articles and you read uh, books and you, you, you write papers about this all the time. And so that became a big part of my training. And as I then went on and actually started working with very, on the very grassroots with just communities on, on, on peace, I still had to place my work in that paradigm, in that framework, because it never goes away. You know, it's I always understood no, ma no matter how deep down to the grassroots I go, this reality doesn't go away. There is no peaceful European security architecture. That opportunity was missed or these attempts were dismissed already in the early 1990s. Um, and so virtually all conflicts that have taken place in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe since then, they have been pushed into this framework, into this paradigm, this like the West against Russia. It is 
uh, an Irish professor who teaches in the U.S., Gerard Toll, has referred to as, as the, the geopolitization of ethnic conflict, or geopolitization of even just village squabbles. Um, and so uh, by the early 2000s, I was working mostly on Chechnya and the North Caucasus region of Russia, which had just come out of a particularly brutal and destructive armed conflict. And it was coming out of it, let's say, very, very slowly. Like for, for a long time, it was a very volatile, violent place. Um, and I wouldn't, I would never go so far as to say that that conflict in that part of Russia happened because of the same reasons that we're now seeing a war in Ukraine. That would be simplistic and it ignores many of the enormous historic and political and social complexities. But this is where I developed grassroots activism together with local women on a community level with youth for about a decade. Um, and occasionally sort of go to other parts of the former Soviet Union for exchanges. And then in 2014, when the war broke out in Ukraine, the first war, the one that was just limited to Eastern Ukraine, uh, and a very old women's peace organization, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, they asked me to be their advisor on Ukraine. Uh, I think they just basically were looking for someone who had worked with grassroots women's group in a post-Soviet context, in a post-conflict context, and also someone who spoke Russian. and. That was basically me. There aren't a lot of people like that. So that meant that from 2015 to 2017, I spent a lot of time on the ground in Ukraine and I engaged and sort of mapped and engaged women activists all over the country, but particularly in the eastern and southern regions affected by conflict. And all of them were working in one way or another on peace, but in a very broad sense. So for them, for some of them, that meant you, they were working on violence against women and girls, including domestic violence. For some of them, many of them, that meant working on the mental health problems and on the reintegration of veterans who were coming back from the front line. Uh, for some of them, it was basic anti-poverty work um, or anti-austerity work, which they very much associated with the conflict, or just basic humanitarian work, just delivering supporting the abandoned populations that were living on both sides of that old front line and who have been living in the middle of war now for eight years. You know, just, most of Ukraine was not at war, but along that front line that sort of cuts from the north to the south, people have been living in war for eight years. And when I was working with these activists in Ukraine, one of the frustrations was for me and for them too, there was really no space to talk about the broader politics of this war, not about the Ukrainian politics, but also not about the regional and global politics. Um, the institutions that should have created spaces like this that were set up to do that, the, the OSCE, the UN, they failed. Western governments failed to follow their own policies. Um, for example, many Western governments, you know, have sort of pinned the UN's 1325 agenda, the Women, Peace and Security agenda to their flag and they have feminist foreign policies and all that. And they say, wow, we believe that women and civil society must be part of making peace. But instead, civil society and women in Ukraine for eight years have been sidelined and marginalized when it comes to peace and security. And this, um, the so-called 1325 agenda, you know, called after the Security Council revolution by that number from 2000. In Ukraine, it was bizarrely and, and, and grotesquely turned into, let's have more women in uniform and posing for calendars. That was it. Um, or some sort of like boutique, like women's groups, but just safely away from, from all relevant politics. And it was really a travesty. It was very frustrating for me because I felt I should be able to have meetings with UN agencies or with embassies in Kiev and, and, and meet with people who believe that this is that the right way, first of all, is to try to make peace. And second, is to make peace in the right way by including the community, by including women. And it was impossible. Um, so what I did and what my my activist friends did is basically, you know, they were all most of them far away from the capital in small cities. And we just understood there was nothing to be gained uh, on that level. And so we focused on the work in the communities. There was plenty and there is to the state plenty of work in the communities. Um, but these women have always been eager and very, very prepared and ready to take the lead in building peace. They have an incredibly sophisticated understanding 
of what it would take to make peace in Ukraine. Um, and and in, in a way, they were, for all these years, keeping the peace in their own cities. Because the war that started in 2014 could potentially have spread much further. And the fact that it didn't is due to women activists, and due to other community-based activists who says, no, this is not going to happen in our city. And I have a story here. I've never read about this story, but it's, it's undoubtedly true because um, local activists told me about it in, in a town that you have not heard about. It's called Zaporizhia. And it is the site of the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. And at the beginning of the war, that power plant was surrounded by Russian troops and there was some shooting at it. And, um, and it, it keeps working. And it's, I don't know, I guess it is under control. But what's interesting here is that um, Zaporizhia is an old industrial town. And so in its social and socioeconomic and political makeup, it's very close to communities in the Donbass, which broke from like Ukraine in 2014. And so in 2014, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the outcome of the Maidan, a lot of sort of frustration with sort of the nationalist agenda coming out of Kiev, and a lot of people who also wanted to break with Kiev, and who also wanted to sort of rise up and challenge the new government in, in, in Kiev. And uh, But what local activists did from both sides, those sort of very much for Kiev, for Maidan, and those were against Kiev and against the Maidan and, and felt more drawn towards the east, towards the Donbass. They came together, just, just activists from different political sides, to sit down. They put in writing like a treaty, like an agreement between themselves, where they said, if either side finds out that some of the young guns in their midst want to like, stage a provocation or start conflict in the city, they would warn each other and they would do everything to prevent from anything happening. And they did this because this is, look guys, we have this major power plant, nuclear power plant here in our city. We have a responsibility to keep the peace here. And to me, the story, I heard the story just, you know, on an afternoon stroll through the park from a friend there. She just told it to me off the cuff. And it's never been covered anywhere. Um, but it, to me, it is an example of how ready people in Ukraine were to make peace and to keep peace and how this potential, they were never allowed to bring that potential to bear. And I feel very much that this is where we are, where we are today. Thank you. Now, Alma, a number of people have noted uh, that they feel we are closer to a nuclear war than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's been said by a number of people, including yourself. But I think you've you've also commented that you feel that the present situation is even more risk prone than it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I wonder if you could just speak a bit more about that and tell us why you you feel that. So again, there are obviously people who are who do this for a living, who, you know, do military planning and, 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 and analyze nuclear war and nuclear risk. Um, most of them are university professors. Um, but their theories, they're out there and we all of them read them and we've been trained in them. And so when you apply them, and this is very much reflected in the discussion around us, um, we can draw lessons from them. And they all say that the, the risk of a nuclear escalation of an escalation to war into a nuclear strike is higher today than all the way back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and probably higher than it was then. And so what are the reasons why it is higher? First of all, there is an actual war on. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was no actual conventional war. Uh, second, many military actors are involved. The Ukrainian military, the Russian military, various paramilitary um, units, uh, various Western militaries, um, volunteers and mercenaries from all over the world. Um, and that means there could be a lot of accidents, there could be misunderstandings, there could be mistakes. Uh, so there's just something could go wrong and from there escalate very quickly. There's also um, a theory that's been out for quite a long time about Russian military nuclear doctrine is that they would what's called escalate to de-escalate. And that means at a moment when they look like they may be losing the war in the conventional war, they may use a what's called a tactical nuke. I want to talk about that a little because it's, it's a horrid term, I think. Yeah. Um, basically, to, to, to get everybody like really scared, it's like, okay, okay, we're backing off. Like, you showed us you're serious. 
that's it, right? So escalate to de-escalate. Um, and then there's also, and we see that especially in the US, but also in some European circles, there's a lot of loose talk about um, nuclear risk. There's a lot of loose talk along the lines of, oh, let's just get boots on the ground. Let's get NATO involved. We should fight to Ukraine. Putin will chicken out. He won't, you know, he won't respond to it. Or, or even people saying, like, what is actually so bad about a small tactical nuclear strike? You know, people saying, look, it's going to happen anyway. We might as well do it first. And I, again, you know, going back to my childhood and, and sort of the late Cold War period, you know, by the time I was 13, I'd already read several children's books about nuclear war because that was how we were brought up to understand what a horrible, horrible thing that would be and that therefore we must never let it happen. And I look around and I feel that the people who are making decisions today should be my age or older and should also remember that. But apparently they do not. And they approach this with, um, with a lightness and a looseness that I find very scary. There's some exceptions. It seems that um, President Joe Biden actually seems to have still a very firm grasp on how this is not something you joke with. Um, but there are a lot of leaders that I think fundamentally lack the seriousness for that. So, so that's why I do want to say that there's still a consensus that even though the risk is higher than it ever was, it is still very low. Like none of the sides actually really want that to happen. Um, it's just that the, the various escalation pathways are, there's so many of them. Okay. And so finally, um, from the contact that you have in Ukraine, what, what can you tell us about what Ukrainians hope for from the UK or from the European and um, other uh, militaries and leaders, governments? I think, you know, there are 40 million Ukrainians and there are lots of different opinions and very much who you are, like your relative privilege and safety. Um, decides what you think. So if some very influential Ukrainian politicians, pundits, you know, sort of prominent civil society activists with very good salaries, Western funded, possibly already sitting in Berlin for a long time, they mostly want more weapons and they mostly want to like fight Russia to win and they want the West to fight with them. Although I think by now they understand that this is not going to happen, but for the longest time they want that. They wanted that and they were very frustrated that it wasn't happening. Um, if you talk to the sort of community-based grassroots women activists I know, they, um, they want negotiations and they are disturbed and scared that a number of Western leaders are telling Ukrainians don't negotiate. Now, Ukraine has been negotiating with Russia since, like, I think, February 28th. Four days into the war, they started negotiating. So, and they are continuing to this day. But there are a number of Western governments and the UK is apparently one of them that is telling the Ukrainians, do not negotiate, we think it's premature. Um, there's a sense in the UK government that, um, that they wanna be more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians, you know? And, uh, and, and, not because they necessarily think this is in Ukraine's best interest, but because they think it makes things worse for Russia and it inflicts more pain and um, harm on Russia. And when I talk to my activist friends about it, I have to be very cautious because this knowledge is, of course, devastating to them, that somebody would think of their country and their cities and their people in that way. They say, we, we, want, to, we want to negotiate. We, we support Zelensky when he goes to these negotiations. We understand how hard it is. We want a, a dignified deal out of these negotiations, but they say we can get a dignified deal because our army and our people have shown that we are ready to stand up, that we can't just be swallowed whole. So they feel they would want Western governments to support the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian people in the choices that the Ukrainian government has already made, which is yes, fight as hard as you can, but also negotiate and try to bring this war to an end. And that you know, there's this is where you have the greatest discrepancy between what Western governments say and what sort of average Ukrainians feel. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay, so it's 
uh, I haven't been managing to keep a proper eye on the chat. Um, Me neither. <laughs> um, so let's see if there are clear questions there. And also if people wish to um, put up hands, then that's fine too. So, um, so there's some of the chat was about the exact, what was actually going on around the power station that I have trouble pronouncing. Um, yes, which is, a, I know that it's got, I think it has, is it six nuclear re reactors? Yeah, Linda, is. yes, and then Margaret, sorry. I'm not paying attention to hands now either. Linda, do you want to go first and then I'll turn to Margaret? I just actually will um, introduce my question out loud instead of in the chat because it's obviously easier. Um, Thank you. So, um, so um, we obviously heard, you know, some stories at the time that Zaporizhia was attacked the first time that this was just a stage thing by Azov, by the Ukrainian neo-Nazis to uh, make it look like the Russians had done it. Uh, your story about the sort of town treaty um, was was very telling. And I assume that because of what you know about that agreement, that 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 version of events is even more improbable to you than it was to us. Right. I am in no position to judge any of this um, because, you know, this treaty happened a long time ago and Azov is the sort of, they're the sort of players who, they're not locals in Zaporizhia, and, but if they are stationed there and if they come in, very few locals would be in a position to control what Azov does. They basically have impunity. Um, I don't, I really don't know what happened there and who shot at that power plant. And there's, you know, this massive fog of war. Uh, and I also have to say, I have one activist friend in Zaporizhia right now, and she's in such stress and she can't leave because she has a disabled daughter who is not, who would um, lose her eyesight if she was transported. And so, so she's stuck there. And, and at the same time, she's trying to help people there. Like she's trying to, right now, she's trying to buy clean socks and underwear for like refugees who are coming in, right? And I just cannot now ask her, can you please explain to me exactly what happened around the power plant? Because I don't want to cause her stress and I don't want to be extractive towards her. I just want to be supportive. Eventually we will hear stories and we will figure out what happened there. I I do think sort of from, from a basic point of, of military strategy you know anyone any invading force that enters a country has a bunch of maps and it has things highlighted on those maps and some of those would be like cultural institutions that you must not bomb like you know like world heritage or something you have like a blue cross right and then there would be places like nuclear power plants where like we absolutely have to control this because if our enemy controls it something bad might happen so I, I was not surprised when early on in the war, Russia tried to control that power plant. There were events, military events happening around the power plant. It would have made sense to me that an invading army would want to control a site like that. But right. that's really as much as I can say. Anything else would be speculation. Thank you. And Pete Roach, uh, who knows quite a lot about you know, nuclear power plants, has put some links in the chat to... Uh, things that I think he would presume are helpful. So thanks for that, Pete. Margaret, do you want to ask your question, please? Margaret Forbes. Yeah, yeah. My, my opinion is that the US is not interested in anybody negotiating or saying a single diplomatic word. There's been nothing but warmongering, aggressive talk from Biden and I think Biden and the USA are the biggest threats to peace. Thank you for that. Um, I'll Do you want me to comment on that? Or? Well if you wish to Alma, you don't I have think, to, but if you wish to, yes. I, I, I have to say that I think uh, the US government clearly saw this war coming um and accepted that it would happen and did not do everything they could have done to to stop that and that's true not just for the last three months or the you know from fall or from spring last year when there were military buildups but this goes back a long time um we have to give biden some credit for not for basically shooting down he's resorting to militarist language here but basically he gets a lot of pressure to do things like to put boots on the ground you know, to, to escalate. Um, and he said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to have NATO fight this war alongside Ukraine. And he's very aware of the threat of nuclear escalation. But that's like sort of like a little too late. Like it's just 
fine, he draws a red line, but all the way up to this red line, there's a lot of war. And they're certainly not giving the support to negotiated outcome that you would expect them to do for any conflict in the world. So that is very conspicuous. It's, it's, it's sort of they're turning a cold shoulder to the ongoing negotiations, the ongoing third party mediation by Turkey. Any other conflict in the world, they would support these processes. And here they don't, not at all, on the contrary. I have to say, um, Boris Johnson has also been, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's actually, I mean, he recently, I think two, three days ago, he said, uh, he's, he's basically told the Ukrainians he wouldn't negotiate with Putin because he's, it's like, it's like uh, negotiating with a crocodile who would bite your leg. Like, why would you negotiate with a crocodile that's got your leg in its jaws, is what he said. But he also said that he expects this war to go on until the end of next year. I don't know where he gets these numbers, but that's what he said. And what's interesting here is that at the same time, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has put out um, a grant call for half a million pounds for women's peace building. And they say, you have to complete these activities in the space of one year towards women's peace building in Ukraine. And one or the other is lying. Um, or one of the others, you know, is not not honest, and I, I you know, I I have to believe it's um, the foreign the foreign office probably is serious about wanting to support women's peace building. There are women, there are experts in the foreign and Commonwealth office who, who understand these things, but on the political level, their earnest and good ideas get absolutely no support. They're basically being sabotaged, right? Um, because here you have a leader of the country going out and saying, oh, this is war is going to go on until the end of next year. Sorry, we can't do anything about it. Thank you. So, um, Kyle, would you like to come in and ask your question? Yes, uh, just on the risk of nuclear war, just wondering if you would agree that uh, one of the best ways to reduce that risk would be the disbandment of the nuclear alliance, which is NATO. Uh, which is really just a hidden arm of US foreign policy in Europe. Well, I Thanks. mean, you know, like, there's obviously right now a lot of discussion about NATO and its purpose. But at this point, the vast majority of NATO members consider it in their benefit to be part of NATO and for NATO to be strong. Um, some of them act out of a desire to, you know, protect power in pursuit of their great power, superpowers, or unipolar, whatever ambitions. Some of them, because they really have, you know, they they have a security dilemma and they think that NATO is the way to is the thing that will protect them. Um, and they will decide what happens with NATO in the future. No one else will. Not us here. Not not any other international organization. It's this is up to them. If they ever understand that a different type of security architecture for Europe would be better. And in fact, such a security architecture has repeatedly been proposed by a number of actors, experts, governments, particularly post-Soviet Russia since 1991. And it just, it was always rejected and dismissed and, and fizzled out. But I mean, here we are 30 years after the end of the Cold War and no, like, will it take us another 30 years to build something better? Right now, we're, we're hurtling down a path towards something far worse, obviously. Thank you. I mean, we obviously, Scottish CND and the peace movement generally would argue that a nuclear, um, a nuclear armed alliance is always going to be a dangerous alliance and that the idea that, that all countries should have nuclear weapons and they'll all be safe is obviously laughable. Um, so uh, that's our position. Um, I wonder now if we should have, we should turn to a more open discussion about the whole connected set of issues so um some people have posted uh just just little exchanges in the chat about some of the things that have come up so somebody's mentioned a book that they read as a child um or that maybe 
is uh, talking about children and nuclear issues, for example, because that came up at some point. Pete's post, Pete Roach, who runs a, a website um, uh, that is a very useful resource. Pete, do you want to just say just a, a quick mention of, of your website and the links that you've posted? I've just put, I just heard this afternoon that the BBC had reported this morning that uh, a couple of missiles have been fired and were seen flying at low altitude over the, the unpronounceable nuclear plant Zaporizhia or something like that, um, uh, which is a bit worrying that they were so close yet again. Um, but in general, I, put, I run a website called no to nuclearpower.org.uk with the where the two is the figure two and uh, I produce a daily news service that um, is free to anybody that wants it which covers everything from what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment to um, Boris Johnson's mad plans to build eight nuclear power plants in Britain and uh, various renewable and climate subjects as well so that goes out every morning um, it's 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 it used to be about 9 30 but it's about 10 o'clock these days because there's so much news so if anybody wants the the details of that i'll put them in the chat and you can sign up and receive it if, if it's of interest to you okay so thank you pete so um roger you've also posted again um let's see if there's any other voices that want to come in as well um not to discourage you, Roger, we'll come back to you though. Um, sorry, now I've lost my visuals. Here we go. Um, anyone else would like to start a new thread or make any kind of contribution or ask either of our speakers a question? Okay, so. Roger, you've said, sorry, somebody else was trying to speak. You've made, you posted something about prosperity and in comparison to Russia, um, which of course was a comment that Alma was making at the beginning when she was talking about her childhood in Austria. Uh, but I think, sorry, go on. I, I saw the comment, and I think uh, the, the question is about like uh, when when Eastern European countries express a desire to join NATO, that they're more attracted to the prosperity in Europe than than what NATO itself represents. Yeah, I think um, I think we have to we have to differentiate here. Like there are a lot of complicated things going on. It is true that many countries in Eastern Europe experienced the period of. Soviet domination and Russian domination um, as traumatic and painful and against their will and saw a military alliance with the West very much as a protection against that. Um, so Poland, uh, Czech Republic and uh, Hungary, I mean, we, we, you know, we think in 1968 Prague Spring, we think 1956, the uprising in Hungary and how they were crushed militarily. So it is understandable. Um, but of course, the way that this was then done, it was done as a zero sum game where like, you know, Russia was left outside of that. And that is sort of a prescription for, for um, instability. It, it, people, a, a lot of Eastern European nations have been suggested in the various sort of like integration and enlargement process that have happened in Europe since 1991, that, um, that they must join NATO before they could even consider, you know, being part of the European Union. By the way, they are also supposed to join the Council of Europe um, in order to join the European Union. Um, so there is that is true. But then, you know, yeah. uh, uh, Europe's neutral countries, Sweden, Finland, Austria, we all joined the EU without joining NATO. Now Finland and Sweden want to join NATO. Austria very much does not. Um, there's a there's a much greater question of how like this desire for 
well-being, justice, safety, and just an end to the constant trauma of stress of just like the injustice and the poverty that has characterized post-Soviet life in places like Ukraine. How that was behind the events that, you know, caused the Maidan uprising in 2004 and you know, how that was also manipulated by oligarchic political interests in Ukraine for their own ends. Um, I mean, certainly people in, in these countries do have a legitimate desire to for more justice, for more predictability, for more protection, for better services, for a better quality of life, and also for more economic opportunity. Um, and, and frankly, why shouldn't they? Um, the way that the EU then engages with these countries, and this is not about the EU because it is sort of the vehicle for economic issues, NATO very much is not, um, is not quite the unmitigated success uh, that the EU t likes to tell about itself by its engagement. It's through its, about its economic engagement in the region and and in the numbers back that up. So there's, there's a lot of Yeah. Yeah. Lind, let, let's Lind, Linda Penskunter yeah. come in. Uh, I think you've got a slight change of tack, perhaps, Linda, but come in, please. I do. Yes. I was wondering, actually, if we, you know, if we can bring Ian back into the conversation um, as well, because um, since we're marking the Chernobyl commemoration today, um, whether both he and Almut could talk a little bit about Chernobyl today, because we've all, we've also, in addition to seeing the Zaporozhye attacks, we've also seen the Chernobyl site become occupied and disoccupied, and and as we've heard, you know, possible stories of, of radiation sickness amongst the Russian soldiers who churned up all that radiation, especially in the Red Forest. And I, I don't think people have. I mean, maybe this audience does, but I'm not sure that the wider audience who might watch this recording has an appreciation for just how dangerous the Chernobyl site still is. So maybe Ian, I don't know if I'm sort of throwing you in the fire here, but maybe if you wanted to oh, yeah. talk about um, that. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll pick up the challenge. May I do that? Um, yes, um, please, yeah. and speak into your microphone if you know where it is, Ian. Right, I don't know where it is, is that better? Yep. Sorry, I, I didn't realize that there was such a problem with microphones, but there we go. Yeah, um, I think that uh, we have to bring this discussion back to the fact that today is April the 26th and it's the anniversary of Chernobyl. Um, I know that many people are worried about the war situation in Ukraine and it is worrying. However, for the purposes of today's meeting, um, I think it's important that a couple of points are brought out. Um, the first is that, um, that many people say, well, yeah, there was an accident in Ukraine. It's a long ways away. Um, don't worry about it. Um, I'm only worried about my back garden. Well, that's basically it. what I've hoped that uh, I've shown is that is a very, very bad and short-sighted attitude. But what goes on in Russia and Ukraine today could affect us here in Britain. Could even affect people in the States if it's really bad. Um, so this is a, not just a, a theoretical point. Um, it's a real practical point. Now, um, to address that, um, as Lynn pointed out at the introduction to this meeting, is that there are uh, on the CND, Scottish CND website, there are two long papers. The first um, paper has got to do with the, the radiation dangers from an attack on a nuclear power station. What would happen? Um, what could go wrong? Uh, what about the fallout from it? Would it affect people? What we can do about that? Um, so I would very much hope that the audience and the extended audience afterwards will go to this Scottish CND website and download um, these two papers. As I said, the first paper has got to do with what happens if there's an attack on a, on a nuclear power station. The second paper has got to do with 
basically it's a primer on radiation. Um, how does radiation affect us? What are the risks? What can we do about it? Um, because the reason why that, that's been added is because there's a great deal of ignorance about radiation. It's not taught anywhere. Um, and just uh, many people fear radiation, but my view, my attitude is that we shouldn't fear it. We should be made, made to be aware of it, to learn about it. And that way we can put some of our fears to, to one side. I think that's everything that I wanted to say, Lim, okay? Thank you, thank you. And um, Linda, were you, you, you happy with that? Do you want to come back on that? And I know you were also posting in the chat about um, women's activism and resolution 1325 was mentioned by Almut. And um, I don't know, the nuclear industry generally is pretty male actually. Um, although, and we know that women are much more susceptible to radiation. Um, so maybe that's also maybe not such a bad thing, um, but uh, negotiations about for about around conflict and um, peace are also ridiculously male, as Linda was commenting, and that clearly is a bad thing. Um, I don't know. So sorry, Pete, you want to come back, please. Yeah. I've um, seen quite a few press reports that uh, at least one Russian soldier has died from radiation sickness after the invasion of Chernobyl. And I was quite surprised. I, I don't really know what the levels are in the soil around there, um, but it seems like they were digging trenches and camping overnight for several nights um, in the Red Forest. Um, does, is that... Does that sound credible to you, Ian, that, um, that somebody well, could die from radiation know, poisoning I, after doing that? It, as, as someone says, this is the fog of war. There's a goodness knows what's happening. For someone to die of radiation poisoning or sickness, they must have had whopping doses in excess of 10 grays or so. And I, goodness knows um, what they were doing to receive such whopping doses? I, I really can't answer that question. I, I just don't know. It's a, it, what's interesting is that they all, many Russian soldiers <laughs> apparently went to the Belarus uh, Radiation Institute, which as you correctly stated, was set up after the 1986 accident to, to deal with the um, vast amount of illness uh, from the radioactive contamination. Um, it, it's very difficult at this remote, remove to, to even get a handle on what's going on right now at Chernobyl. Um, I don't know why. For a start, all the radiation monitoring equipment has been stolen. So um, how on earth anybody can get, a, get to grips with anything is, well, frankly, it's impossible. Grossi is taking uh, monitors with him uh, when he goes to the plant. Well, good luck. That's all I can say. Let's, um, let's hope that um, there's a modicum of sanity going on there. Um, I, I, I think that the, um, the, um, the story about someone dying from radiation monitoring or radiation uh, exposures is far-fetched, that's about the best that I can say. Basically, until we get much more information, it's difficult to say one way or the other. It could have been in the plant itself and done something that he shouldn't have done inside the plant. Um, it's hard to say, Pete. If, if it's true that he died, that is. Yeah, I mean, I just don't know how, how, on, earth, how on earth he got such whopping doses, um, or if, if he did, it's difficult to say. Um, I, my view is that any information coming out from Chernobyl or even Zafaritsa, um, I treat it as, as highly suspect until it's confirmed independently. Um, because there's a lot of rumors going on by both sides. 
um, uh, the fog of war, the first casualty is truth. So um, it's very difficult to say anything realistic about it. Just to be wary is the best thing. Janet, you've posted a comment. Do you, did you want to speak to it? Not especially, Lynn, but I, I think it, it uh, Almut's comments um, very much focused on the reality of the need to hear women's voices and to hear the voices of women that are serious about working for peace. Um, and uh, the disproportionate impact on women and girls is is well known to everybody that's in this meeting. Um, to me, the big issue is actually the sexist, racist discourse. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK, so I'm not going to I think let's just see if there's any other final uh, comments or remarks. I mean, it's been a rather, it is a somber, it is a somber occasion, the anniversary of this catastrophe. It remains the worst nuclear accident in the world, although um, we're coming close. Um, sometimes uh, we don't want to get any closer. Um, John, please come in. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'll just come out of the shadows. On the anniversary, I think it would be great if we all just remembered the bravery and self-sacrifice of the workers at Chernobyl who went in to do their best to yeah. limit the damage that had been caused, knowing that they were going to die under horrible circumstances. So yes. I would just like to say we should, you know, have a thought for them. Absolutely. Completely agree. I can't believe that any of us would disagree with that. Um, and any further comments or contributions that people want to make? I'm just checking the chat because I'm not very good at keeping my eye on it. I just, um, just to say, I've just posted two articles, two links. Um, they came out on the same day. One of them was by me and one of them was by Beth Voronio, who's a, a great feminist thought leader in Canada, actually about sort of the absence of, of women's peace building in Ukraine, which particularly for countries like Canada is, 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 so, is so terrible because it is a country that has, you know, it's, it's very proud of having a feminist foreign policy. So there's a sense that like all these good practices, all these lessons of how we build peace, how we do it right, that they are, they are thrown out the window the moment it concerns our own geopolitical interests or it concerns something serious, right? Like it's it's okay to apply these practices if it's some godforsaken you know third world country where people sit on the ground um, barefooted um, and and I'm being ironic here but that is the impression we're yeah, getting yeah. but when it's about something serious then it's, it's you, you get those pictures from these negotiations and it's just men on both sides of the table staring at each other and it reminds me very much of these images that we see from like the Versailles peace conference or something you know it's just, just men in suits and uniforms with strange facial hair. Yeah. We made a very, very bad piece there. Yeah, right? indeed. Margaret, Margaret Forbes, muted. yes, you, you're, you're muted. Sorry, Margaret, you need to unmute. Sorry. I was aware at the time when I saw that I can still see the picture in my mind of the lorries going towards Chernobyl. I was aware at the time of what these people were doing, these men were doing. I've never forgotten them. Yeah. Thank you for that, Margaret. Thank you. Yep. And it is important that we don't forget. It is very important. Um, and there's always, you know, there are terrible losses and victims. And we, we are hopefully doing our best to make sure this doesn't happen again, um, all in our own, our own ways, in doing what we can. Um, and I guess that's also why, uh, well, Scottish C&D would encourage you to, to, if not join us, join, join something like us, um, wherever you are, a peace movement organisation and an organisation that is concerned with the links between nuclear weapons and nuclear power and the risks of nuclear power 
and is trying to move us away from away from both. So I just want to, I think we should thank our speakers in the conventional way. I mean, <laughs> sort of thank you very much to you both. You did us, you did us proud. And uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll make the recording available on YouTube, our YouTube channel. And I, before I shut the meeting, I'll try to copy the chat because I think there were some quite interesting and important links in that too. So with John's help, I think um, we'll try to copy the chat. But meanwhile, I'll just wish you all good night and I hope you have the rest of the evening a pleasant evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions and for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the invitation, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both. It was a pleasure to hear you. <laughs>